Hi everyone, as we're admitting you here, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put a poll question uh, before we get started here uh, into the chat. If you could take just a quick moment to uh, answer that for us. The question was, how many of you have taken 20 minutes for your daily exercise today? I see some of the responses coming in. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, well, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're about two minutes uh, past the hour, um, but just wanted to say a quick uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tyler Rouse. Uh, I am the Senior Account Manager of Partnerships here at Genev. Uh, today's talk um, is going to center around uh, lifestyle support and menopause, and so I'm actually going to be joined today uh, by Stacy Kassianchuk. Stacy is our Senior Director of Nutrition and Lifestyle Care at Genev. And so um, I do believe that they'll have quite a few talking, point, uh, talking points that are going to pique your interest. Um, and just wanted to mention, uh, as usual, uh, with our webinars, uh, you can expect us to capture any of your questions that you input during today's session. Uh, we'll try and have a Q&A at the end of today's talk, uh, but if a question is relevant to a talking point, we'll make sure we try and address that as well. Uh, this will be recorded. Um, and we will be sure to include uh, the recording in an email uh, afterwards. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, let a few more um, just answer our poll question. A few more join us um, before I go ahead and let uh, Stacy join me on video and we get started. Pamela, I saw your response. Uh, make sure you get to it before bed. I love that. I myself have been trying to work on uh, remaining active and trying to take 20 minutes. Um, it's a, it's an important uh, thing, I think, for for all walks of life. All right. So I've got uh, this all pulled up. Uh, Stacy, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started here. And uh, as you can see here, like I mentioned, Stacy is our Senior Director of Nutrition and Lifestyle Care. Uh, we do have it listed as Director. She was recently promoted to a Senior Director here at Genev. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started here and let uh, Stacy uh, begin her presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. And thank you everyone for joining, taking time out of your day um, to join this presentation. Uh, admittedly, I am biased, but I do think this lifestyle piece um, around how to navigate menopause with this component is super important and often doesn't get the attention it deserves. So hopefully, um, you know, the goal here with today's presentation is to give you ideas on where lifestyle can fit as you are navigating your menopause journey and how Genev can help with that. Um, Tyler, the poll question is a great one. We'll dive into that a little bit more um, in this presentation on where movements for your body fits in, um, but certainly that's definitely something that we focus on um, with our patients. All right, next slide, Tyler. So here is our mini agenda for today. I am going to talk to you about who Genev is, how do we help, um, what's going on in your body right now. That is often a question we see with our patients of like, what the heck is happening? Um, it You are not imagining it. Um, I, I apologize immensely um, for any of you that have been told that um, by others. Um, unfortunately, that is the case with a lot of situations. People are told, don't worry about it. Um, but we're here to tell you that there are things you can do and you aren't imagining it. Um, and we'll go dive into that a little bit more. Uh, I want to provide some insights and advice on how you go from just surviving to really thriving during this time. There's no reason that you should have to suffer through this. Um, and we want to make sure that we provide that support to you um, here, a starting point with this webinar, and then additionally, what we can do at Genev. So the um, couple um, uh, 
couple other things that we'll go over, Tyler, if you can go back just a little bit and I'll finish up those last ones. Thanks. Um, where I'll give you some insight on what is it like working with a Genev RDN? Uh, some, and RDN is a registered dietitian nutritionist. Some people are like, why do I need that person to work with during my menopause journey? So we'll dive into that and then look at how we can navigate the journey together and specifically those lifestyle strategies that can be helpful. So here's some information on Genev as a company. Um, so certainly over here on the left, um, we have these clinical outcomes and our patient experience that we want to highlight here. Um, we have a net promoter score of about 97. Um, this really, this net promoter score, for those of you that may not be familiar, is would people recommend Genev to other people? Um, and so we're really proud of that. And what, um, and really what this speaks to is the experience our patient have patients have working with both our doctors and our dietitians. Um, we are also are looking at a high symptom improvement. Um, we are, we do see a, a diversity of patients as well. And so we do, um, especially being in all 50 states across the country. Uh, um, and then we're also looking at um, a high patient utilization. So um, seven appointments per patient, usually on an annual basis. So we're seeing them pretty consistently between our doctors and our dietitians to really provide that consistency of care. We have a variety of types of care that we're offering through our providers listed here. Um, and this all comes through in terms of what your goals are, and we tailor our offerings to that. We are working on expanding our health plan coverage. So right now we are in network um, with Aetna and United Healthcare nationally. Um, and we're also looking at Emblem Health um, nationally on all commercial plans. Um, and Progeny is a network that we have um, a relationship as well. So with these facts here, we have over 50 providers. We, like I mentioned, we serve, um, we provide services in all 50 states. We have a menopause assessment that's accessible through our website and we have over 350,000 of these completed. And then we have a whole library that's free to you. If you need a place to start, our library of articles have, um, we have over 500 of these medically reviewed educational resources that can be a great place just to verify, validate what you're feeling and get uh, and have a starting point. We also have um, five employer training programs um, that fall in line with supporting DEI initiatives. So a um, little bit of background on Genev um, as we go into this next part of the presentation. So what is going on in your body? Um, there are many reasons why you may be experiencing the changes in the body that you are. Primarily, though, there is a shift in hormones happening during peri to postmenopause. A little bit of definitions here. Perimenopause is the initial start of the hormonal shifts that are happening. Um, and most likely, your these shifts are happening without you even knowing it. Similar to adolescence um, and puberty, those hormone shifts start happening and then we start noticing changes as a result and then um, and then we're, we're going through that adolescent um, pu uh, pubescent phase and then we're on the other side with those changes it's not it's different in what you're experiencing um, but that hormonal fluctuation and the progression of it is, is rather similar it's just going rather than hormones increasing they're actually decreasing and so during that perimenopausal phase when you really get into the thick of it and often for individuals Individuals. This is going to be um, in the late 30s, early 40s. That's when people tend to be more symptomatic. Post uh, menopause is the one year anniversary without a menstrual cycle. And then after that, that the next day, you're postmenopausal, um, and the the symptoms tend to be less for most people that as those hormones start to level off at their new low level. Um, but they are um, there could still be some other symptoms and certainly some health things to be thinking of. The lifestyle habits um, that you implement during this time can be critical to supporting current and long term health. And what we often hear is everything I've done before doesn't feel the same or isn't working the same way. And the reason for that, you're absolutely right, and the reason for that is your physiology is different. The hormone shifts that have happened have changed your physiology, and therefore we need to implement different strategies to support that changing physiology during this time. So how do you go from surviving to thriving this unpredictable stage? This, the 
unpredictability of it certainly is uncomfortable for many, many people, not knowing when is this going to end? Is it going to end? That's often a question I get from patients like, um, I'm starting to think this may never end. Is it going to? And it will. It does end. Um, but certainly when it does, you're in a different physiological state than you were previously. And that takes some both um, the, some psychological and physical adjustments that we want to be able to account for. And really when we're thinking about surviving, um, that surviving is just getting through it and just pushing through it. When you can implement certain lifestyle strategies focused on your nutrition, on your sleep, stress management, movement, mindfulness, a lot of different factors coming together can really take this to a place of thriving. And we do have patients that get to a point where they say, you know what, I'm actually feeling the best I ever have in my life. It sometimes can take time to get there, especially given the hormonal changes that are happening in the background. So at Genev, our dietitians are all trained in menopause. So in addition to our diet, dietetics curriculum, where we're certainly trained in nutrition um, and lifestyle behaviors, we also um, have been trained by our gynecologists here at Genev, and specifically our chief medical officer, Dr. Dunsmore Sue, um, in the menopause. And so we understand the transitions you're going through, the hormonal changes that are happening, and then where those lifestyle pieces fit in to support you at that time. The other piece is that we absolutely want to provide the space and the, um, the accountability and support for you to be able to talk about what you're experiencing, have your questions answered. Often this is a topic that many individuals aren't comfortable talking to even their friends about, depending on what stage of life their friends are at, or their partners or their work colleagues. And so we want to give you that space and that time to really be able to voice your concerns, get the answers you're looking for, and then be able to get the strategy to support you in feeling better. So what does working with a Genev registered dietitian look like? So it is a personalized approach for each person that we work with. So no, by no means is it cookie cutter. And if you come in, everybody's getting the same thing because quite frankly, um, even though the menopause journey or the menopause transition will happen to every individual born with ovaries, the experience can vary person to person. And we wanna honor that with the recommendations that we provide. So when it comes to our approaches, um, when it comes to nutrition, often, again, coming back to some one of the main concerns we do see um, during this transition is changes in body weight, shape, or size. And often individuals will go to trying to do what maybe they had done in the past to, um, to support a, a body weight that they feel most comfortable in. And they find, hey, this isn't working the same way again. So where we can help provide that education on the why behind why these strategies may not work the same way. And then here are some that may. And rather than just saying, oh, go eat more fruits and vegetables, I know probably everyone on this call knows that. And I will raise my hand, be the first to raise my hand that, to say, even as a dietitian, I could do better in that arena. We're going to give you strategies to say, okay, what are you currently doing with your meal and snack routine? And then how can we enhance that in a way that adds nutrients to your nutrition plan so that you're nourishing your body during this transition and working with that changing physiology rather than against it. And so sometimes for some individuals, it's really helpful just to have some meal and snack and recipe recommendations to get them started. Um, often then we see pe people take off with those meal and snack recommendations and get excited on their own and start doing their own meal planning. Some, other, some others um, do need a little bit more guidance around that and we're able to honor wherever you are in that process. Certainly when it comes to physical activity, uh, we asked a question at the beginning of the call, how many of you have gotten in at least 20 minutes of exercise this morning or the, today? Um, it's 1.15 where I am in, in Oregon. Um, and I personally, I am a morning mover. Um, if I don't get to my movement in, in the morning, um, it's just not gonna happen the rest of the day. I did see that someone else had mentioned that it will happen before you get to bed. That's what matters. When is it gonna happen? And is it something that you 
you can you can access and is it something that you enjoy and we want to account for all of that as we're providing guidance for you um, making sure that you're aware there are some recommendations that can be more supportive around changes during peri and postmenopause specifically um, incorporating resistance training or strength training but we make our recommendations in a way that fits for you and your lifestyle the resources um, that you have available and how to make it work for you sleep support is another area um, the sleep challenges that peri and postmenopausal women face is really hard and it can make other lifestyle habits challenging. So we offer a variety of different strategies to help with sleep. Um, everything from a sleep wind down routine to even things to do if you wake in the middle of the night, as well as looking at how nutrition and exercise during the day can play into your sleep habits. So a variety of different options that we can provide support there. I always I tell people that, um, that the menopause transition is a little bit poor design in terms of its timing. Um, it often is a time of higher stress for individuals. They may be, you may be at a high point in your career, so you have a lot of responsibilities with your work. Um, it could be a time of either um, teenage or adolescent kids or perhaps kids leaving the, the home and you have either empty nest or college, college tours or college applications or college visits to be attending to. And then it can also be a time when you have older parents aging and maybe having to care for them. So a lot of different things happening during this time that can really increase stress. And we want to make sure that um, that you're able to have the skills to manage that. And sometimes those skills, even if you had a fabulous stress management plan pre-menopausally, it may not work the same way. And we wanna make sure you have the tools to do that. As dietitians, we do have training in being able to help you understand suppl supplements that could be helpful or not. Um, often we will uh, look at supplements that our patients are currently taking and help you understand which ones may be worth their, their cost and others that maybe you can save some money on um, and certainly make recommendations where appropriate. Currently, our visits, um, our initial visit is a full 50-minute visit, so you get um, close to an hour of time where, with that dietitian to really dive in to figure out what the best strategies are for you. And then our follow-up visits are 30 minutes, so we're able to check in, see how things are going with the plan that we've set, that we've given you, and then answer any questions and help provide that accountability to keep moving forward. Between our calls, we do offer unlimited text communication. Um, this is something that it's not required, but we find that so many patients, given this volatile time of life um, where a lot of things are changing, it's just really helpful to have a resource where you can check back in, ask questions, follow up. And then we can also reach out and say, how is your meal prep going? Is there anything that came up as a barrier? Can I offer support or alternative strategies? So we're with you the whole way to make sure that you have the support you need. We are also um, linked hand in hand. I like to think of us as the connective tissue between our doctors, your doctor appointments. Um, and we typically recommend starting with a physician appointment so that you know what medical options are available to you. Um, this does include uh, the ability to explore if hormone therapy is appropriate. Uh, as dietitians, we cannot prescribe um, any type of medication. So that's where collaboration with our physicians um, is, a, is a beautiful relationship that we have. And we're able to see our physician notes. They're able to see ours. In the events that in between your uh, visit with your physician, you have a question for the physician, you can always reach out to us via text and we can reach out to the physician or let you know, you know what, this is something that really deserves a, a full evaluation and an appointment, um, but you're able to get that guidance. Again, you don't have to figure that out on your own. And one of the main components we use um, is behavior change coaching. We're all cha trained in behavior change science. Sometimes this is heard about as health coaching. Um, and it's really this way for us to help you have that unbiased party that's there to support you um, and ask the right questions to get you thinking about what is it that you need to be able to go from surviving to thriving. Um, so that skill set is something that we want to make sure to bring to you again, so that you get the most out of your care.
All right. So what does it look like if we have a patient journey here? And here's an example um, of Allison where she comes in and is struggling with weight gain, noticing changes in her body shape and size. Hot flashes are starting and all of a sudden there's this increase in anxiety. Often I may hear that um, a patient will say, you know, I've had anxiety my whole life or as long as I can remember, but it's different now. It feels a little bit different. It, something's different. And that's absolutely true. That's all valid. And these are things that we want to make sure that you get the support with. So like I mentioned, starting with an appointment with one of our gynecologists allows um, a review of your symptoms and any medical diagnosis and guidance there. And this is where, if appropriate, um, different medications may be prescribed to support symptom management. We do a mental health screening, the um, PHQ-2 um, and or 9. Um, with each visit. This is really a couple of reasons for this. One, mental health um, and behavioral health is important for everyone. And we we value that um, we value that for all of you and want to make sure that if you are in a situation where you need support, that we're providing it for you. The other piece is that we want you to be thinking about this. This is also a prompt for you to just check in to think, how is my mental health these days? This is an important factor. And we do see an increase in depression and anxiety um, among peri and postmenopausal women. And we want to make sure that you get the support you deserve. Then, as I mentioned, or um, if appropriate, some, and I will say some people may not need um, registered dietitian support. Um, however, we do find that the majority of our patients do best when they have the support of a physician and the dietitian together. And so our um, gynecologist can then um, refer you in to our work with a dietitian and then whatever um, the symptoms are that are most impactful on your quality of life, that's where we start and put together those plans that I talked about previously. If needed, um, the there is we do have an option to refer to a behavioral health partner. So if you are um, wanting to have uh, therapy support and, and that um, or psychologist, psychiatrist, or um, uh, licensed therapist, they're all available, and we can provide that referral for you. Typically, the uh, follow-up appointment with a gynecologist will be, um, the second one will be in about three to four months, especially if they've recommended or prescribed any type of treatment. They want to check in, make sure everything's working. And if you're at a place where it's working really well, often then the next follow-up isn't for six or 12 months. You can always follow up sooner if needed, um, but that's typically the cadence that we look at there. Now, the dietitian appointments, um, we, like I mentioned, they tend to be more frequent just to help you implement those behavior changes and get settled into certain habits. So then those tend to be um, anywhere between two to three weeks at a time, but they're in between those appointments with those doctors so that you have that resource. Sometimes um, there may be a situation where your the symptoms you're um, describing do require a um, in-person visit. And uh, there are obviously some limitations with um, a telehealth platform. We can't do any type of physical exam. So if that's the case, our physicians will recommend that to you. And if you have an established in-person care, then certainly they'll let you know this is what you should go to that um, provider for. If not, we can help you to find someone that um, may be within your area. So here are the common symptoms um, that we treat at Genev. I will say this is not exhaustive. And just because if your symptom isn't listed here doesn't mean it's not real. It certainly, um, certainly is and valid. And we still want you to come and tell us about it. But these are going to be the primary ones that we see. Um, often when we look at that menopause assessment, um, data, we the weight changes, um, decrease in libido, mood changes, sleep, and sleep disturbances are our top reported symptoms. Hot flashes, which tends to get all of the, all of the attention uh, when we look at uh, the media and the press, um, is listed as number five. So some people experiencing hot flashes, experience hot flashes. Some people don't. Um, but the main thing is that whatever you're experiencing, that you're noticing these changes, is that you are getting the support you deserve um, and we can we can treat all of these um, so that you're able to again th uh, thrive rather than just survive.
So I talked a little bit about this um, when I mentioned what is it like to work with a registered dietitian at Genev and the format there. So a little bit more detail here in terms of those lifestyle strategies. We're going to tackle the nutrition piece of it and what that looks like for you. The phys physical activity that includes aspects of strength training, cardiovascular exercise, flexibility, balance, mobility. How do we help you to move in your body in a way that feels good? Supplement recommendations there. The supplement world is so overwhelming, whether you're walking down the supplement aisle or trying to navigate through all of the um, targeted ads that we get. Um, it can be it can feel really um, hard to know what's what should I take? What should I not? What's safe? What's not? And we can help you navigate that. With sleep, it does um, often this is it tends to be best addressed with a combined approach with our physicians, um, especially using hormone therapy treatments um, if you if you are a candidate for that. But there are a lot of lifestyle strategies that can be implemented in conjunction um, to really optimize your sleep at this time. And then that stress management piece, we want to have you have that toolbox built, of really simple techniques and strategies to help improve that quality of life. The one that um, if, you, none, if you aren't already doing it, a super powerful strategy is breath, taking deep, simple breaths. What I have seen patients get out of one to three minutes per day of deep intentional breathing um, is almost hard to believe, but um, it is a very powerful activator of our parasympathetic, that rest and digest side of our nervous system. So that's a little take home lifestyle strategy for you. If you're not including deep intentional breath for one to three minutes, I'm not talking about a full three hour meditation routine, um, not necessary unless that fits into your day and feels good for you. But just a little bit of that deep breathing can go a long way during this, this phase. So next steps here, um, we want you to come to Genev, check out what we have to offer. Like I mentioned, if you're wanting to just kind of see what it's about, maybe you're on this webinar and thinking, I don't know if I'm in perimenopause or not. I'm not sure if I need an appointment, but I'd like to learn more. Check out our articles. Um, they're easy to read. They have tangible information, can help you to really just start that um, navigation piece. Uh, if you are ready to dive right in and talk with um, a provider, we do recommend talking to a physician first so that you get that full assessment of where you are in your menopause journey and recommendations for next steps. Um, so to do that, you just head over to our website. Uh, click on the talk to a physician. You'll be prompted to set up an account so that you can access appointment uh, scheduling and then take it away from there. So um, we really want to make sure that you're getting the support that you deserve. Um, and then from there, certainly scheduling with a dietitian is an option. You do have the option. You can still go to creating an account and scheduling with a dietitian directly if you feel like you have a physician all lined up. Um, but if you don't have a physician in place, uh, we do recommend that as a starting point. Thank you all for your attention. Um, I have heard the chat kind of going along as I've been presenting. Um, so I am going to turn it over to Tyler to feed me some questions because I have not been able to see all that's coming through in the chat. I look forward to reading it afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so all of the um, kind of the dings you might have heard in the chat were just some really great comments uh, just in regards to whether it was symptoms or just how to sign up and create an account. Um, so we I was able to answer most of those um, and then we had some other questions in our Q&A pertaining to um, our quiz and resources as well as some other um, coverage questions. Um, so I did answer most of those. Um, and I'm not seeing anything additional unless someone maybe had a, a question they wanted to input in the chat. Um, we'll give some people some time to input their questions that way. Uh, but in the meantime, what I'd like to do real quick is just uh, add another poll um, live uh, to um, the chat. If you could go take a look at that's just us asking you if your knowledge of uh, menopause has increased uh, during today's session. Um, but again, we will save some time for any additional questions that come through the chat or the Q&A. Yeah, Stacey, this is great. I appreciate you you walking through this. I think lifestyle support in general is a is a really important topic, and I love uh, the framing that we 
uh, that you were able to talk through today. So yeah, um, and I think it is one of those things um, that we all know these things are helpful for us. What I hear the most from patients is that they get to a point, especially in this journey, where they recognize how critical it is. They now prioritize these things. And that is not an easy place to be, um, especially if you have often prioritized other people's needs or other aspects of your life for many years, making that switch can be hard. And that's where we're here to help you um, in navigating that. And it does take some time um, and can be more of a transition, but definitely not impossible. And the payoffs are worth it. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I did see a question come through. Let's see. It says, how does our uh, an insurance apply to our gen of OBGYN and dietitian appointments? <laughs> And they said Aetna insurance. Is that what they said? Correct. Yeah, it looks like we uh, looks like Devin answers that these are covered as specialist visits on your Aetna plan, which was how I was going to reply. Um, uh, one question came through, um, Stacey, that I'd, I'd love for uh, for you to answer. Um, someone asked, I have heard drinking soy milk before bed can help with hot flashes at night. Is that valid? Um, I would say that's a reasonable exper experiment to try. It will be different per each person. Where that is probably coming from um, is the fact that soy milk does contain phytoestrogens. So these are plant estrogens. One thing to be aware of it, these are not the same estrogens in your body. Um, they're estrogen-like, um, but they're not the same. Some, there has been some research to show that whole food soy, so um, found in soy milk, edamame, tofu, tempeh, miso, um, some of those whole food sources can help to mitigate symptoms, um, mitigate menopause symptoms. Anecdotally, I would say that my experience with working with patients with this is it varies. Some people know, notice a little bit of relief, but it does depend on the extent of the symptoms um, as well as the the symptoms themselves. So is it hot flashes that we're looking to help with, um, which is what a lot of the soy research has looked at, or is it anxiety and low libido and vaginal dryness, which are different sets of symptoms um, and may not be as um, effective, although not in possible. Um, so that would be something that would certainly be an experiment. There's little harm in having some soy milk before bed and seeing what helps. Um, but certainly if it's not helping, there's other options to try. The other plug I'll put for um, soy nutrients in general, there is a lot of research to support the, ben the cardiovascular risk benefits. And that's something we didn't talk about in detail here. But um, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women. Many people think it's breast cancer, um, but it's actually cardiovascular cardiovascular disease. And during the peri to postmenopausal transition, the uh, risk for cardiovascular disease increases because you no longer have the same level of protection given the decrease in estrogen. So anything that you can do um, to help mitigate that cardiovascular disease risk, increasing soy consumption, the other habits that we talked about around nutrition, exercise, and stress management um, are all levers that you want to pull on or, or tools that you want to add to your toolkit. That's great. Thank you, Stacy. Um, I had another question come through uh, asking if we could, or if you, Stacy, could share any thoughts on the connection, if any, uh, on the connection, if any, between higher cholesterol levels and hormone changes in menopause. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine this is impacted with discussion with a dietitian. Yes, absolutely. I'm happy to uh, address that and ties right back into the cardiovascular piece I mentioned um, previously. So we do see an increase, we tend to see an increase in the LDL cholesterol levels um, uh, through peri to post menopause. Um, and part of this is thought to be in relation to, again, that changing in hormones. The other part that we, that um, changing hormones that decrease estrogen um, does is it also provides a uh, decreases the flexibility of our vessels. So if you think about your vessels, you want them to be really pliable and bendable um, as that blood is flowing through our body. When they start to get stiffer, um, that's when um, the, the plaques can start to form and cause those blockages that we obviously don't want to have. So especially, especially with that increasing um, 
cholesterol level. So on the lifestyle side of things, the one thing that we often focus on, you know, everyone thinks, oh, my cholesterol is elevating, then I need to decrease my cholesterol. Research now shows it's not a direct relationship between your intake of cholesterol as much as actually saturated fat has a greater impact on cholesterol levels. However, what, again, coming back to, let's think about what to add. Adding fiber um, is going to be, I typically see greater improvements in blood cholesterol levels with an increase in fiber versus a decrease in anything else. So adding things like beans, lentils, your uh, fruits, your vegetables, that helps to bind that LDL cholesterol levels and help with excretion. So again, when those changing hormones are not as supportive as they used to be, you want to think about other strategies that can help mitigate that. Increasing fiber is one of them, and then exercise is another one. That's great, Stacey. That's actually um, a good uh, kind of segue to this next question that was just asking about some foods that are high in magnesium, vitamin D, and fiber. Foods that are high in magnesium, vitamin D, and fiber. So, yes. So magnesium, you're going to be um, actually nuts and seeds. So that's a great fiber fiber source there as well. Um, the vitamin D is tough. Um, it's very limited in terms of food. Mushrooms, believe it or not, um, are a pretty good source of vitamin D. Um, and then salmon, egg yolks, and any fortified dairy or plant-based milk products are going to have vitamin D. However, typically the vitamin D is one that you're going to want to supplement with, especially if you have a history of a low vitamin D. Vitamin D is really important for bone health, which many people are aware of. It's also important for muscle function. We're seeing some connections to brain health as well. Um, so I typically recommend when it comes to vitamin D, certainly eat salmon, eat eggs, make sure you're eating the yolk. That's where the, um, that's where the vitamin D is going to be. Never going to hurt to add some mushrooms to your, to your nutrition plan um, or that fortified dairy or dairy alternatives. However, to get the amount that you need, you're probably going to need to supplement. Um, if you can get a blood test, uh, I always recommend getting that checked annually just to see where you are. That will let you know how much supplementation you need or at least a reflection of what your current habits are um, to optimize those vitamin D levels. And what was the other uh, magnesium, vitamin D, and what was the other one? Fiber. Oh, fiber. Yeah. So fiber are going to be all, anything, any plant, anything that grows in the ground, comes from the ground is going to have fiber in it. Um, and so certainly your fruits, your vegetables, your beans, your lentils, your oats are going to be heavy hitters, your broccoli, your cauliflower, um, things that often produce gas. Those are the ones that are going to be higher in fiber, um, but they're going to also provide additional benefits. There's a lot of fiber supplements out there now. Sometimes they are appropriate. But I highly recommend going with the food first approach. You're going to get a whole plethora of other nutrients um, with that. That's great. Uh, someone kind of staying in line with uh, nutrition, um, someone had asked just in regards to kind of alcohol and how it relates to mm -hmm. um, hot flashes. They had said that just after one glass was even triggering them. And so they were just curious if, if uh, there was a proven link between them. We do see an increase in in menopause symptoms in general um, with alcohol and sometimes for some individuals, even caffeine. Um, and the metabolism of these seems to change. The mechanism, we're not exactly sure, but there's certainly, again, your physiology is changing. So there's a whole system, a, per, a whole system change. And so metabolically, things are just happening differently. Um, and so the alcohol, one side of it certainly seems um, to be a trigger for some people around hot flashes or night sweats. Um, the other um, piece I also hear a lot of patients will say, I used to be able to enjoy two glasses of wine over the course of a night, wake up the next day, go to work, no problem. Now I have one glass of wine and I feel like I went out on like an all night bender, like what the heck is happening here? Um, and so again, it speaks to just the difference in that metabolism and, and looking for ways to still be able to mitigate that. Um, for some people, going uh, no alcohol option is their best route and they feel better with that. For some people, it's a compromise with some alternatives, whether they're non-alcoholic alternatives or lower alcohol options, or sometimes it's a matter of 
you know, certain spirits actually feel better than wine. And so you're able to put together a strategy that works for you. That's great. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, kind of shifting gears here, uh, someone had also asked in the chat, uh, are there other options if unable to utilize HRT due to increase in BP? So if depending on what the symptoms are or what the what you want hormone therapy for, there can be other options. There's always other options, alternatives to manage symptoms. Let me put it that way. Um, right now, there is a medication. Um, you may have heard of it. If there's actually there's been some commercials on it, which is great to see menopause commercials um, coming to the, the forefront on national TV. Um, but uh, Vioza is a non-hormonal um hot flash medication that can be used for individuals where hormone therapy may be contraindicated. Now, it's only for hot flash symptoms. Um, so if that's not the main symptom of concern, uh, there may need to be some other um, options explored. So it does depend on the symptoms, but for nearly all menopause symptoms, there are other options to help to mitigate it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, someone had also asked, um, in regards to oral estrogen uh, having significant cardiovascular benefits and kind of just calling out that there might be a higher blood clot risk, um, but was curious on uh, whether or not uh, the same benefits are achieved when taking transdermal estradiol. Um, and so I think the question was just like, what is recommended? That's going to be an individual scenario, and that's a great um, question to bring to a first appointment with one of our physicians. Generally speaking, every med every hormone medication has pros and cons, um, and really what it comes down to is what is the most the best dosage, the best type, and the best delivery for you as an individual, and that's going to be related to your health history, perhaps if you've tried other hormone therapies in the past, um, and what your goals are and what your symptoms are. And often it can be a little bit of trial and error. Again, remember that we're working with treating a, a physiology that's changed. And so you want to, um, sometimes it takes a little bit of titration with those hormones, which is why our doctors recommend that initial three month follow up. Let's make sure what we're doing is working um, before they send you on your way for any length of time. Um, so typically that's what we see when we are um, working with, with different hormone therapy options. Thank you. Um, someone had also asked um, in regards to like a uh, recommendation, they had been told that uh, flex seed with warm water in the morning can uh, mm. sometimes help with hot flashes. Have you heard of that, Stacey, or have any kind of other remedies? I have, and um, I have a patient who um, is not a candidate for um, for hormone therapy, and she has done um, significant experiment, experimenting with flax, um, and it's been interesting to see her experimentation, uh, and has found a slight mitigation in her symptoms, um, so it can be beneficial. Flaxseed also, also is a great source of fiber and some healthy omega-3 fats, so you're getting some other benefits there that you actually don't get from um, hormone therapy. So as far as the fiber and the omega-3s. Um, so it certainly is another thing. I'd put it in the same camp as the the soy milk. Give it a try, see if it helps. Um, and there's probably little to no harm in, in, in doing that. That's great, thank you. Uh, I had another question uh, in regards to, um, they asked, can postmenopausal form new ovarian cysts? And if yes, do they dissolve mm -hmm. on their own? What can one do to reduce the size of cysts or formation of new ovarian cysts? That is a fabulous question. One that I will have to defer to our physician team. Um, that's certainly an area of medicine that there's less less on the lifestyle side of things, not to say that lifestyle can't be helpful in managing ovarian cysts, but certainly deserves um, a medical, a, a full medical assessment. And again, taking into account your individual health history. Understood. Um, I had uh, a question here. Um, I, I actually really liked this question. Uh, Stacey, they had asked, what would be two to three tips on what to change or focus on for early postmenopause that tend to be helpful to stop weight gain, especially belly weight? Mm. So the things here, so a couple of things when it comes to um, the weight piece. Um, one thing to know is that weight gain during peri and postmenopause is common um, for most individuals going through that shift, um, going through this transition. 
It can vary how much for individual, and that's most likely genetically determined. It could be influenced by, um, by lifestyle habits as well, um, but there's certainly a genetic predisposition that underlies that. So a couple of things to think about. On the one hand, um, thinking about what, what lifestyle habits could you um, could you adjust? So certainly there is benefits to increasing resistance training that may help in terms of mitigating weight weight gain or just exercise in general. Um, it becomes a, a more important, again, thinking about that change in physiology to have activity as a regular part of your of your week. The other part on the, um, the nutrition side of things, protein and fiber. Um, that's where I, I focus um, our or the RDN team here at Genev, we often focus with our patients on that. Typically, individuals think if I'm gaining weight, I have to restrict something. I have to exercise more and I have to restrict what I'm taking in. That can create an, a stressful environment for the body that's already going through a stressful time um, with these changes in hormones. And we want to work with the body work versus against it nourishing the body with foods. And again, coming back to those high fiber options that I mentioned, your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, things that also provide so many other nutrients that are important to our body are great places to focus on increasing. If you want to target for the day, aiming for about 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. Um, you could split that out throughout your meals and your snacks um, can be a great place to start and, and working up to that. And then on the protein side of things, aiming for anywhere between 15 to some individuals may need upwards of 25 grams per meal. That can vary on your body size, on your goals, on your activity level. So again, a great opportunity to get personalized recommendations working with a Genev dietitian. But the fiber and the protein would be another component to that. The last thing, the third thing um, I would put there, so we have your, your exercise, your nutrition, and then I'm also gonna put mindset in there. Um, Often we there are certainly times where implementing these habits may support a um, a decrease in body weight or a change in body shape and size. Sometimes it doesn't, um, but it doesn't mean that the the individual's health is negatively impacted. It could still be enhanced. And when we look at the shift in body shape and size over this period of of life happening to most individuals, often there is a there may be an underlying protective reason that our body is doing that and we're continuing to learn with the research. So I often encourage um, individuals to often think about what is it um, about this changing body that um, is most challenging for you and how do we help you to feel better in your body regardless of its shape and size um, because we, we live in a very critical world so that um, is very critical of our, our changing bodies as women and we need to start rethinking some of that and so I think there's also a mindset piece that is important here for us all to tackle in this transition. Yeah, that, I love that. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah, someone had asked a, a question in regards to, um, you know, similar physical activity as well as diet. Uh, they had called out uh, the, the, the fatigue thing is real. Mm. Uh, they've eliminated processed foods for the most part. They added protein to their daily diet, along with strength training and yoga. Uh, they said six days per week, but still feeling uh, extremely fatigued. Uh, they were just curious, was there anything else that they could try for more energy? Uh so certainly um, the fatigue is real and with the um and with the, the having the energy to be able to exercise, there's kind of a catch-22. Um, you know, often think making sure that you're getting the right nutrients throughout the day. One thing I always remind people, um, while carbohydrate intake may need to shift, whether it's a Carbohydrates are a form of energy. So looking at when you're having your carbohydrates, having them with a source of protein can allow for more um, smooth delivery of energy. Um, and that is also can also be um, a, a way to support overall energy levels. Um, the other piece on the energy is really navigating the sleep um, and taking a deeper dive. I have had patients who have felt that they were getting okay sleep, um, but when they did a sleep assessment, um, like a, an at-home sleep study, so not necessarily going to a lab, but they found that they were actually having more wakefulness and um, 
lower oxygen levels during sleep that was impacting their quality of sleep. And that can certainly play into fatigue over time. So I think there's always room for deeper exploration to the root of it. Um, and then being able to address that root cause of that fatigue um, tends to be most effective. That's great. Yeah, I love the well-rounded uh, answer there, Stacey. Thank you. Um, someone had asked specifically about Serenol and was wondering mm. if it was good for moods and anxiety, and they were just wondering if you'd agreed. So with some of those types of supplements, um, they can be helpful for some individuals. I always recommend, you know, again, this is going to be something that you want to take into account with your individual situation um, related to other medications you may be taking and your health history, um, because for some individuals, they may not be appropriate and they can exacerbate symptoms. The other piece with all supplements is that they are not regulated by the FDA. Um, so there is little oversight in terms of what may be in the bottle and what may not be in the bottle. And so one way to mitigate that risk is to have a, um, a make sure that you have a third party verification um, for that supplement. So something like NSF um, is one that's out there. And so that it verifies that that company has paid some other company to verify the, their supplement. It's not a guarantee, but at least there's a little bit of a security blanket there. And then and always checking with a medical professional, especially your physician, if you have other medications prescribed for contraindications um, of those medications, um, of those supplements with the medications. Thank you, Stacey. Um, someone had just asked uh, in regards to any tips or advice for hair loss. Um, they were mm -hmm. saying it was almost as hard to deal with as weight gain. So the hair loss piece um, is interesting too, and I see this impacting patients differently. Um, one thing, a good place to start would always be a, a or um, going to see a dermatologist um, because they can rule, it certainly can be influenced by the changes in hormones, but you also want to rule out anything else. Sometimes there can be medications. Um, it might, depending on the degree of hair loss, medications may be appropriate. The other piece, there are some, um, the other piece from a nutrition standpoint is making sure you are getting adequate protein. Protein is definitely necessary for hair, skin, and nails. And sometimes, um, especially if you are restricting your intake and anyway with weight gain concerns. Um, I find that um, if you're not getting enough protein, that can impact hair as well. The other piece, um, there are different products out there that may help to enhance um, your hair growth. And that's something to also explore uh, on an individual basis if there are some products or supplements that could help um, with that. And then for some individuals, um, hormone therapy actually does the trick. Um, again, working on um, using that as a means to mitigate those symptoms. Thank you. Uh, one last question here, um, and then we'll we'll go ahead and close out the webinar. But uh, this question was just asking your thoughts, Stacey, on intermittent fasting during menopause. Good question. Um, you, you had to land on like, do we have another day to talk about? Um, but the intermittent fasting one is interesting, and it's one of those areas where we there's a lot of different data out there. Um, I think one of the areas of less data is specifically in peri- and postmenopausal women. Um, one thing I try to uh, um, always work with our patients on is when we think about implementing any type of lifestyle strategy or change, what is going to be key in effectiveness is consistency and longevity of what you're doing. And so if you can do something, if you're thinking about doing something and you think you can do this for the rest of your life, it's most likely going to be most supportive. But if this feels like something, ah, I can do this for four to six weeks, but not much longer than that, it's probably not going to work. And I find that that happens a lot with intermittent fasting, um, that people can do it for a limited amount of time, but they aren't able to stick with it, in which case it's not gonna be a, an overall effective strategy. There are some scenarios um, where we look at some of the data for generally sedentary individuals where intermittent fasting may help to manage um, diabetes risk um, in diabetics or pre-diabetic individuals. There has been some research 
research done on that, I would say we see that men respond better than women. Um, so again, keeping that in mind. Um, the other piece that I often find happens with intermittent fasting is that it's easy for people to, it gives them permission to skip breakfast. Um, that seems easy to do, but by the end of the day, they're starving. So then they get home, they're rushed to get dinner ready or get on the table for the family may or may not have something in mind to make. So they're grabbing things from the pantry, trying to get some snacks. And when we grab for things that are easy, they tend to be more processed, higher sugar, higher fat. Um, and then even when they may have a dinner meal, they're still hungry after dinner at a time when they're fatigued, decision-making may not be the greatest, and they certainly don't want to prepare a healthy meal at that point. And so the choices that they're making at that point, when then they're going to bed, slowing down their activity and their movement tends to be a little bit lopsided. So that, and then it doesn't seem to have the effect. So what I typically recommend if someone wants to do a um, try intermittent fasting is to do a prolonged nightly fast where you may give anywhere from 12 to 14 hours between your dinner and breakfast the next day. Um, but then between that time when you are eating, you're having those regular, regularly scheduled meals um, so that you are providing the nourishment to your body. The other thing we want to think about as we um, talked about related to nutrition, you we want to deliver nutrients to your body. And the less opportunity you do that throughout the day, um, the less opportunity your body gets to get that fiber and protein that we talked about. So long answer, like I said, we could go on for a few more hours on that topic. Um, but the, um, again, find out, come work with us, find out if um, intermittent fasting could be a strategy for you and how to make it work for you long term. Wonderful. Thank you, Stacey. Well, uh, I just wanted to thank you all for taking some time out of your Wednesday afternoon to attend our, our webinar on lifestyle support with menopause. Uh, thank you, Stacey, uh, for presenting and, and answering some questions today. I just wanted to let you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we will be sending an email out with a recording of today's session uh, so you can go back and, and listen to all of the great content we were able to provide. And just also just wanted to let you know that on April 24th, we will have a another webinar, uh, as we do monthly, regarding Menopause 101, where Dr. Dunsmore Sue from our team will be uh, doing a presentation. And we hope to see you there. And I hope that all of you have a great uh, rest of your Wednesday and a good rest of your week. Thanks, Take care. Tyler.